Hey everyone, this is Dr. Reese Barrick at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History and this is a new way to museum. So before we get into it today, again, if you get a chance and, and you've been enjoying what we've been talking about, give us a like and a subscribe and we'll be able to keep bringing you this uh, content for as long as we can. <laughs> anyway, we enjoy it and we enjoy having you with us. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about mass extinctions. Mass extinctions are really kind of, we, we think about extinction as being a really horrible thing, but extinctions are really big drivers of innovation. And so we want to talk a little bit about the effect of mass extinctions on the history of life. So if we jump back a little bit, paleontologists, and biologists, um, back in the 1700s and 1800s were going around and they were finding fossils in rocks and once they realized that fossils actually represented life they would notice that in the rocks they'd find different forms of life throughout um, different rocks and they would change and the rocks generally you know um, they decided that or began to understand that rocks that were at the bottom of a section were older, rocks at the top of a section were younger. And with some of these ideas, they then could see that there was changes in the type of life through rock sections. And that meant that there was changes of life through time. And as these paleontologists started trying to piece together um, rocks from around Europe and different parts of the world, they could correlate them and find out that life changed through time. And as they did that, they started to break up the rock record into geologic periods. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and the Paleogene and Neogene. So these changes were based, uh, these time periods were based on changes in life forms found in the rocks. That's all, it kind of makes sense. And so these big changes in life meant changes in our time periods. Cool. Well then, we had uh, a couple of paleontologists, um, David Raup and Jack Sapkowski, that looked in the marine realm specifically. And Jack was a real big with, with um, numbers and statistics and Dave was a really amazing invertebrate paleontologist and he started cataloging and grouping uh, life in the uh, marine realm into genera and families and he started cataloging how much of any given rock record these individual groups lasted before they went extinct. And Sapkowski took all this and, and modeled it and came up with the fact that there were five major mass extinction events between the Cambrian and today. And interestingly, these five major mass extinction events correlate with boundaries between different time periods. So we actually talk about the history of life into the Paleozoic or ancient life, the Mesozoic, middle life, and Cenozoic, modern life. And the change between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic and the Mesozoic and Cenozoic are the two biggest mass extinction events in the history of life. So it kind of makes sense. There's going to be major changes in life when you have a mass extinction event. There's also three other major mass extinction events, one at the end of the Ordovician, one at the end of the Devonian, and one at the end of the Triassic, which separate more time periods. So uh, a lot of the changes in the history of life are due to mass extinctions, and that's really how we built our geologic time scale. So that's pretty cool. And so we look at a lot of these things and we wonder why were there mass extinctions? Well, mass extinctions can happen for a number of reasons. Um, ultimately, it's changes in habitat, habitat loss, and some of that can be due to climate change. Uh, it could be a lot colder or a lot hotter. And a lot of that can be due to other causes like 
asteroid impacts or major volcanism um, that can really change the planet. And it also can have to do with plate tectonics. Are all the continents crashing into each other like Pangaea? Are all they split apart um, like the continents are today? Or are they all under the southern hemisphere? If we go back far enough, all of the continents were basically over Antarctica and in the southern hemisphere. Then they moved around and split up into the northern and southern hemisphere. So depending on how the continents were arranged, aligned uh, or arranged and what was going on with the atmosphere, whether there was lots of volcanism, um, really changed the habitats and eventually at different times caused some major changes in life. So what are, what's interesting, if we look at the five big mass extinctions, there's some really kind of interesting uh, things to think about. Their Ordovician and the Devonian mass extinctions lost 25 and basically 20 to 25 percent of the marine families, all right? But yet they lost 70 to 85 percent of the species on the planet when extinct. Like, how does that happen? Well, if you think about it in your neighborhood, you might know that there's a few families that have 10 or 12 kids, and there's a bunch of families that have an only child. Well, you could, if, if all of the, the families that had 10 kids all died, and the ones that had one or two kids survived, you could lose a lot of people, but not a lot of families. So that's kind of an analogy of what happened in, in these early extinction events, was that there were, um, there was a lot of diversification of life, so there was lots of different families, and some of them were being more successful than others, and those successful ones, a lot of them went extinct. So we lost lots of species, um, but not necessarily lots of families. And that turnover um, corresponded with lots of changes in climate, which was changes in amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and CO2 in the atmosphere, and also with um, drops in sea level. And when you drop sea level, there's a lot less um, shallow marine space. And most marine life, if you look today, is very close to the coasts. And it's because that's where the shallow water is, where you can still get sunlight at the seafloor. So if you eliminate that, that shallow area, um, because sea level drops, then you have much less shallow area that gets sunlight and a lot more that's deeper and gets no sunlight which is going to affect what things can live there. Um, then you get to the Permian mass extinction, and this is the huge one, right? So this is one where we had massive volcanism in the Siberian traps um, in Siberia uh, today. It wasn't quite there in the Permian, but this completely changed the atmosphere and also at the same time, we had Pangaea, so we had um, one big continent, so we had very little coastline, so there was not a lot of space for life, and you had this massive um, volcanic event which dumped all kinds of methane and um, all sorts of gases into the atmosphere, which changed the climate and heated it up. So uh, we had an extinction that was 57, over half of the fam marine families, which meant there was 90% of the species were lost. Um, similar in the Triassic, it was a little bit smaller, 75% of the species. And at the end of the Cretaceous, we had 70% of the species go extinct. That's the dinosaurs and all of their relatives and the ammonites and the mosasaurs and a lot of the cool animals we think of from Jurassic Park all go extinct. Um, but only 17% of the marine families went extinct at that time. So what's cool to think about is all of the life that we have today had to be evolve from what survived the previous mass extinction. So when you think about today and all of the diversity of life and the splendor of life today, you have to think back and go, all right, well, at the end of the Ordovician, 85% of the species on the planet went extinct. So that means everything, all life that 
evolved in the Silurian and the Devonian, and diversity increases up again, had to evolve from the 15% of life that survived the Ordovician. Then you have another extinction event, and you lose 70% of the species. So now, all life that evolved in the Carboniferous and the Permian had to have evolved from the 30% of life that survived the Devonian mass extinction. And that was only stuff that survived the Ordovician mass extinction, right? So then, as we're getting life back to sort of equilibrium, we have this mass extinction that wipes out 90% of the species on the planet, all right? So all life today is a result of the 10% of life that survived the Permian mass extinction, so, right? So the fact that we're here today is because something survived the mass extinction. It was part of the 10% of life that survived that mass extinction. Then we had all the life that gets a big jump back in the Triassic. And just as life gets going again, you get another mass extinction. And then you get a long period of time between mass extinctions and the diversity of life goes crazy, right? Life evolves, fills up all kinds of niches, lots of new species. But all those species evolved from what survived the Triassic mass extinction. And then we hit the Cretaceous, and we have this big asteroid impact. And it changes the planet. And we lose, again, 70% of the species, of marine species, go extinct. So at that point in time now, everything that is around today was part of the 30% that survived the Cretaceous mass extinction. So if there weren't a couple little mammals that survived the Cretaceous mass extinction, we wouldn't be here today. And those mammals wouldn't have been here if they hadn't survived the Triassic mass extinction and the things that evolved into mammals hadn't survived the Permian mass extinction, we wouldn't be here today. So it's kind of an amazing thing to think that the huge diversity of life today as a result of what survived the previous mass extinction. So why is it then, if we have all of these mass extinctions and we have much more uh, reduction in sort of the number of diversity of, of upper level um, organisms, why do we get so many more species today? Well, the cool thing happens is that innovation happens when there's disruption. Innovation meaning life figuring out new ways to make a living or trying out new things. Um, whenever there's sort of a stable ecosystem, life fills up some niches and then everything goes along smoothly, but there's not a chance for new innovation to come up with a new way of making a living because all the niches are, are holding sort of that innovation down. You need to have disruption to get new innovation, right? So. Um, in the marine realm, a lot of times, it's the coast where there's lots of energy, but the, you've got tides that go down and there's exposure to air, then you're covered up by the ocean. All this energy is rough. It's hard for life to survive there, but that's where new innovation shows up. And that new innovation survives well and sort of kicks the older stuff off into deeper water. It's kind of the same way with mass extinctions. When you get a disruption and you kill a whole bunch of life, then what's left that survived is, has the opportunity to explore, not just fill up the old niches, but explore new ways of making a living and creating um, new types of, of uh, morphologies and ecospace and creating new niches. So uh, we'd never have a wolf getting a chance to survive if all of the raptors hadn't gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So there's uh, always these new inventive ways of making a living that happen because there are mass extinctions. And so we are going through a mass extinction right now and we're stressed about it. It's a human caused one and but life will rebound especially if we go extinct too. <laughs> um, because life finds a way and, and gets very creative. So Mass extinctions, they're the reason we have 
geologic time periods. They're the reason for changes in life. And they're also, um, while devastating for um, short periods of time, a few million years, life always generally rebounds and increases diversity because the more different type of niches that are created, the more species you can have. And that's why, in general, you can see that between the Permian and today, with a couple of mass extinctions, a whole bunch of new adaptive radiation and new adaptive changes and additions to ways of making a living means that we are able to fill up a whole bunch of new niches so diversity goes up to the highest it's ever been in the history of life. So that's pretty cool. Mass extinctions, short-term death, long-term innovation. All right, so mass extinctions are cool, they're fun to study, and they're important in the history of life. So appreciate you uh, joining me to talk about mass extinctions, and we look forward to seeing you again next week on A New Way to Museum here at the Sternberg Museum. See you, everyone. Thanks for joining us in A New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.